Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We're your hosts, Suzanne Kearns and Missy Stevens. We want to help you through everything that happens in the ellipses, from your professional life to your emotional health. You're a mom and so much more. Let's figure out what comes next together. Welcome to the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. I'm Suzanne Kearns, Mom and Dot 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 writer, LGBTQ and sex ed advocate, and this week totally maxed out holiday event or like concerts, events, parties, mm-hmm. school thing, everything, everything. everything. <laughs> so, yes, yes, I feel yeah. Yeah. And I'm Missy Stevens, mom and dot, 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 writer, foster child advocate. And this week, officially back to wearing two of the same shoe. My foot is no longer broken and I ditched my sexy surgical shoe. I'm so very exciting. So excited for you. Yeah. I'm only wearing two tennis shoes, but still. Yeah. It's exciting to have <laughs> Not two of the same shoes. On. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And today we are really happy to welcome Kimberly Diedrichson to the show. Kimberly spent 15 years growing her career at a Fortune 100 company. She held roles in business development, account management, and was part of building a new sales division and managed teams with portfolios of over 20 million in yearly sales. Her career was essentially her baby, and then she had a real baby, an event that absolutely turned her world upside down. After becoming a parent, she discovered a deep passion for supporting working mothers through the transition into motherhood while also helping organizations retain their mothers as they enter into a new season of life with the growth of their families. Kimberly lives in Huntington Beach, California with her husband, three children, and two dogs. Welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Oh, well, we just want to squeeze every bit of information yep. out of you that we can. <laughs> like, yep. like our, it's, if we talk about this a lot. Our Venn diagram of interests and things that we care about is just basically one big circle. So really yeah. <laughs> excited to learn more about you and your businesses. So got a little bit of your story in the bio, but can you help fill in some of the gaps of how your career started and progressed? And like you said, how motherhood flipped that on its head and impacted some of those choices? Yeah, it's interesting because when I was in high school, I sort of always wanted to like work in a high rise building and wear a suit. And Mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess I was intrigued living in Maine where there were no time raises and there were no suits. It was more flannels all day long. (laughs) And so I sought out that experience. I went to a business school in New England and started my career exactly how I had hoped, although it was only a two-story building in San Diego. Um, <laughs> that still is higher than nothing. Yeah. Still yeah. higher than what I would have experienced otherwise. And then it just took off. I landed with an organization that was in high growth mode, uh, the stock like while I was there it was just a really cool experience and I was in for it I loved every minute of it I was really into building my career building like what I envisioned it to be at that executive level and just very driven to have that experience and then I also at the same point was excited to have a family and was looking forward to having that experience And then it actually happened and it sort of (laughs) shocked me, (laughs) you know, again, like just really looking at it from rose colored glasses and not knowing the ins and outs of what that was going to feel like. I was, you know, right there with all my other friends in terms of going through the experience of having kids. So, you know, we were all sort of going through it at the same time. So it wasn't like I had anyone further along saying, hey, look at this. This is what's going to happen to you. But I also right. didn't experience it at work. So people had families, but I didn't know about it, really. It was sort of like you're saying your goodbyes for the end of the day. And you just kind of like walk to your car and say oh, goodbye to that coworker, But you didn't think about like what life they were having. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. So yeah, once I was pregnant with our first son, I could not believe First of all, like how many changes were happening to my body. I sort of didn't appreciate any of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're kind of difficult to appreciate at times. Yeah. I was not, I ex- again, going back to this red colored glasses, like I thought, oh my gosh, like I'm going to love this. This is what I had hoped for and dreamed of. And yet 
I wasn't loving that experience of, mm-hmm. you know, everything swelling and um, mm-hmm. being so exhausted and just like everything that was about me, about being this driven career person was being challenged by pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I also was fighting that hardcore in the sense that I was interviewing for a position that was going to require a lot of travel after having our son. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think anything of it. I experienced some intense um, comments about that from other colleagues. Um, Like what? It was it was like, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to interview for this position? And that's okay. also from senior management, um, mm-hmm. which is not, you know, at the time, I didn't think of that as like, oh, they're knocking me because of my pregnancy. But looking back, I realized wow, that was so inappropriate and not yes. okay. And then I had our, and I didn't get that position. And I had our son And I literally didn't know who I was anymore because Mm -hmm. I had this immense love for this human and also this immense love that I had for my career. And I wasn't sure how I could show up and be that person in my career. And then also somehow love my child the same way. How was I going to perform in both roles the way that I, you know, kind of thought was the level of expectation that I put on myself. And that really started my thought of learning motherhood because I was I was so shocked that there was nothing about this. There was nothing about returning to a career after having a baby. It was, I just heard like you power through and none mm-hmm. of my friends were going back to their career at that point. They were either taking a pause or deciding that their career was going to be staying at home, which is also a lot of work, but no one was going right back to work after parental leave. And I was like, the clock was ticking. Mm -hmm. And the experience really threw me into postpartum depression. I couldn't like, I had to really practice on how to get to the offense before I actually went back to work because I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, Mm -hmm. Was that and literally I, like, I'm going to drive to the office and this is how I'm going to dressed, do it. Get dressed, do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was practicing before that, like how to just drive like away from the house for more than five, 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. It was wow. practicing being away for an hour. I had so much anxiety about leaving our baby that I didn't know how to like connect who I was before to who I was now. And, you know, there's so many parents and I say parents out because, you know, obviously everyone's impacted by this in Mm -hmm. some way where they're fighting with this emotionally on their own. You, You know, they're showing up, you know, we're on Zoom here talking today and they're showing up on Zoom, having these conversations for work and silently suffering and then leaving. And I felt like, wow, that's not how we should approach this. We do these amazing things. We have these benefits, but we're not supporting those that are navigating so many things and we're losing good people. There's, yeah. there's got to be a change. No. I, we want to dive into learning motherhood, which is what was born out of this, this conflict. I want to stop for one second for two things. One, just to acknowledge like that pull of two different people. Mm-hmm. I see Suzanne shaking her head. I remember it so well. I still feel it at times. I guess I don't know if that's good news or bad news. <laughs> My children are so old. You still feel it like that motherhood. It changes you. It changes your priorities and your values and everything you thought you were. And um, I love your story of wanting to wear a business suit. I, that's mm-hmm. absolutely what I wanted too. And I got it. I got to wear my suit and work in the high rise up on the, you know, 40, whatever floor. And, yep. but it, in the end, that's not where I ended up because everything just collided and exploded. So I appreciate you sharing that so much. And so in a minute, we're going to jump into learning motherhood, your company that came out of that. But before we do that, We talked to your podcast partner, Ashley, a couple episodes ago, back in episode 98. But in case anyone listening today missed that one, can you just give us a little rundown on Motherhood and Career Collide podcast that you two host together? 
Yeah, we started this during the pandemic and it was out of like this need to have a place to talk about these things uh, Mm -hmm. in a very like real way. And the part that I love about our podcast is Ashley and I come from different backgrounds in almost every way. So she is in the medical field, which I don't, I now have more intel on that, (laughs) but at the time, like hearing sort of like what she experienced in the workplace and what that looked like for her in the medical field. She comes with a different perspective related to that, which is very Mm -hmm. interesting in a very male dominated position and also coming from where she came from in orthopedics. So for me, coming from corporate America and having like a completely different set of lenses on my own experience, her growing up in a two-family household. I grew up in a single family. My mom was a single mom. And so like, we just had very interesting outlooks. West Coast means East Coast. She's from New Jersey. So it's like a nice marriage. And we just wanted a place to talk about parenting and mothering and the workplace and come to it with some research-based data to land on our topics. So we we really try to include... Some of that, because that's who we are. That's who we are outside of the podcast. So we always weave in an article, um, research that we have. uh, And then sometimes we do just banter back and forth on something about our real life experiences. It's such a great podcast. 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 We were so surprised to find out that you two didn't know each other really before the podcast. What a fun way to get to know each other. Yeah, (laughs) she actually, she sent me a message on when I launched Learning Motherhood. She sent a a message via our website, my website, and I have been following her on Instagram and was so excited to talk to her. And then when we talked on the phone, it was just instant connection. I was like, oh my gosh, why does she have to live in New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So then I I came to her and was like, hey, I want to do a podcast like so we can just talk about all the things that we talk about on text messages and DMs and mm-hmm. let's have a place to actually have those conversations live. Love it. We are so advocating much. for you two to have an in-person retreat. You need Absolutely. it. I know, since we heard you have not met in person yet, so you need to do that. I know, we really do. (laughs) Oh my gosh. And for anyone listening, if you are a listener of our podcast, then you definitely need to go over and immediately follow Motherhood and Career Collide. Mm -hmm. Um, Just, you're going to love it. So we'll have the links to that in the show notes too. But since uh, since we did cover that a little bit in episode 98, we did want to spend most of our time talking about learning motherhood, which... I mean, Missy, I think you agree that every person who's in the family planning phase of life, whether from any parent, doesn't have to be a mother, needs to know about the services that you offer. And getting really smart about transitioning between parental leave and returning to work. And I was going to ask you where the idea came from, but just hearing your background, I know (laughs) I can see exactly where the idea came from. Um, But so how did you take that first step? And then how has it grown to what it is today? So the first step was really, there was a mommy and me class here in Orange County. And I had proposed some topics to her of doing a career parenting group because none of the parents that work could do any of these activities after going back to work. So Mm -hmm. they couldn't have this group experience that you know, I sort of looked at it and said, wow, there's this tribe being built of support for those staying home with their kids. What's the tribe for those returning to work? Yeah. And there isn't one. And so my goal was to create that experience where moms could feel connected to being in person, bring their babies if they want. And we could talk about these topics that are real for moms that are returning to a career outside of the home after parental leave. And finally, we launched in the fall of 2019. And it was really to like build up what we wanted this to turn into later in the trajectory of the company that we're trying to build. So it was a lot of like researching and doing these groups for 
both of me and for them. Like it was really just an amazing, safe, incredible experience. And what I learned from it was no matter the industry you're in, there are some nuances that are different based on, you know, if you're an attorney or if you're a teacher, the experience that you have of returning has very similar aspects to it. And that's where we kind of built up our programming to create our online offering and then to build out our company offering um, based on, you know, my experience in corporate America and leadership in HR, and then also kind of navigating what an individual experience is, whether you are an attorney or a teacher or in science or an engineer or in sales, like all these different pieces and components, we had the opportunity to really experience and see. Mm -hmm. And it was, first of all, it was incredibly empowering. And I love those in-person groups that was, that was a very sacred place. So that is part of like what I will always have for learning motherhood is that sacred place. Right now it's been online. I I hope we do it again in person because that just built such great relationships that I'm still close to those individuals today. I love it. I wish that you, that learning motherhood had existed when I was learning motherhood. We never stop learning. More good news. But um, (laughs) I just, that time when you're making that decision, whatever your transition is going to be, whether you're deciding to be a stay-at-home mom, which Suzanne and I ultimately did for a while. And so that's close to our hearts. But just going back in, you've talked about how it can be anywhere from intense to just completely crushing. Like there's nothing really less than that. I don't think it's easy or simple for anybody. So how have you found in the course of your doing your work and your research, what are the best ways to prepare for the fact that this intense feeling is going to come at you no matter which decision you make, no matter which part of the transition you're in or how many times you've made the transition because you might've done it before and now you're going back to work or vice versa. Yeah. You know, some of this is difficult to prepare for, right? Like you don't know how you're going to feel or like me, for instance, I thought I was just going to put my baby on my hip, drop him off at daycare and return to work and be on my merry way. And that was completely the opposite of what I experienced. I couldn't even get around the block my house for months, you know? So there are some components and 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 acknowledging that that is the key is, is part of the preparing. Like, I know for me, when I was talking about going on parental leave at work, it was, when are you coming back? When are you coming mm-hmm. back? What is the time frame you're looking at? And I said, you know what? I don't know how my bird is going to go. I don't know if there's going to be complication. I don't know if there's going to be complications with my infant. I don't know right now. And so what I can tell you is I'm going to come back as soon as I'm ready. And, you know, what the law gives me access to. And from that, I'll work from that um, framework and I'll keep you in the know. But I, I can't, like, if I give you an answer and then I renege that answer, then I'm not going to feel good about that. What I am going to do is prepare the best I can. So this is what I know I have access to based on the state I live in the country I'm in. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I'm going to work towards what feels good for me. And hopefully that that it is something that we can all agree upon. So what that comes down to is really that logistical piece that's such a key mm-hmm. component to helping kind of give yourself the space for those emotions. I know that when you're kind of working through some of this, it can be hard to say, I don't know when I'm coming back. There's also so many reasons why you wouldn't say that, right? Like (laughs) you might not have a job because Mm -hmm. someone might take that the wrong way. So I also acknowledge that. But if you work towards saying, this is the law, this is what I have access to, I'm going to work backwards from this, then at least you're you're in a position of confidence because you know that information. So I always say logistics is really important to this transition and feeling solid in terms of giving yourself the opportunity to have those emotions. 
And I, I think, think that's such amazing foresight that you had to be able to say that because I just was so wrapped up in what am I going to do and who am I going to be and how is this going to go? Like to have sat with your employer and said, this is what is available to me. Like that's mm -hmm. very calm, cool and collected of you, I think. And I love that advice that you're now sharing with other women. Thank you. <laughs> I, that, you know, it's hard to take compliments of that, but thank you. I appreciate it. You know, I think that that was one of the things that was such a, one of the things that's probably my favorite thing about learning motherhood is empowering our parents to be able to have these conversations and feel yes. confident about it. And mm -hmm. I've had to do them myself. So I know how mm -hmm. hard it is. I also had the expectation that my HR team was going to know these answers mm -hmm. and they, and, and not to knock the HR team, they're doing mm -hmm. the best they can, but to expect them to know all the different laws and also feel confident in sharing them is not an easy task. And so yeah. you own that, unfortunately. Like, and to be honest, you have to own it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be able to speak confidently about what you have access to. Uh, and if we rely on what HR has told us, we might miss out on something. And that's just the reality. My company was located in Massachusetts. We were in California. And I was told, you know, you need to go look at what the state offers. They were mm -hmm. not going to tell me. And yeah. because they were nervous about getting sued for telling me the wrong information. Oh, uh, so, you know, there is these little intricacies that you've got to keep in mind for your own ability to advocate for yourself. I love that, you know, you're getting ready to prepare for these conversations. What are those primary conversations and where do you even start researching? Is it just Googling Great like question. state of Texas maternity leave laws? Like, is, is that where you start and where, when should they start? I mean, is this as soon as this second line shows up on the test or, <laughs> or is this three months before the maternity leave? Like what does right. that timeline look like? I guess it all depends on where you are in your feelings towards it. So for me, I like when I started family planning, like thinking, okay, we're going to have a family. I started looking at, you know, what does my company offer for family support with parental leave? And then when I was actually pregnant, then I started probably around three months looking into what I have access to in terms of parental leave for the state and company. Again, so re-reviewing that and federal. So state, federal and company re-reviewing that before I shared information with my boss, my HR team, I wanted to be prepared. And I guess like this just comes from, I never wanted to be in the defense. I wanted to be in the offense. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to feel really confident about the information so that I was having a conversation that felt like we were both in equal playing field. And it wasn't that I was worried about my job. I knew my rights. I knew what I had access to so that I could be better positioned to have these conversations is really I think the best for anyone out there going through this journey, it is incredibly confusing. Yes. So just to add the cherry on top, it is <laughs> very challenging to navigate what you have access to on a company level, state level, and then try to put it all together on what you can get paid for and then what federal offering can cover you as well. So it it's not an easy feat. And, and I will add that, you know, resources and support to navigate that hugely beneficial. And mm -hmm. what's the worst it does is give you more time with your, your baby or yeah. uh, get you paid more. Or, I mean, yeah. there's really no negative to it. And I, I'm just thinking back to this time in my life before my daughter was born. I mean, the amount of research that I did about cribs and like even the best mobile or whatever to have yeah. over the crib <laughs> and like just the amount of research on strollers and accessories and things. And I really, it was like last minute that I finally did stuff that it was around HR. And part of it, I'm trying, 
I'm trying to dig up like what was that feeling? What was my hesitancy? Mm -hmm. And I think I felt greedy, like I was asking them for something. Like it was this big favor that, you know, I was inconveniencing them. And now I was asking them for, you know, money and all this time off and whatever. And I still had in the back of my mind just this. I had every intention of going back to work. I was taking my four months off and then my husband was going to take three months off. He got paternity leave as well. And then I was going to go back to work and use that as like my trial period while he was doing that. And plus mm -hmm. we did not have childcare. We got signed up for childcare like pretty much as soon as I found out I was pregnant and it's still, the space was not available even mm -hmm. after seven months. <laughs> after, that's why I ended up uh, not going back to work or leaving because the childcare spot is still not opened up. So, I mean, just, I feel like that was in the back of my mind. Like, well, what if after those three months, you know, I don't end up coming back and then mm -hmm. here they've been so generous and they've paid my insurance during this time. And uh, I don't know. I, how do we get rid of that weird swirling guilt like that we owe? Right, because really them. that's the contract you enter into when you go to work for someone that they yes. are going to pay for that. It's sort of crazy to have that guilt over it. Yes. But that's. It's like getting guilty about using condition. health insurance for, right. you know, if you get hit by a car or something. Right. Like, like oh, I'm so uh, sorry when you pay for my broken I leg. know. I'm so sorry. But I don't know. Yeah. That, again, that's just part of my personality. I don't know if any of right. our listeners can sympathize or even need an answer to that question. But it, just knowing that you shouldn't feel like I did um, no. when but you're some, approaching HR. So many do. And it's. It's rightfully so. There's nothing that celebrates that time off, to be honest, mm -hmm. in our in oh. in the US. Like it's not celebrated. It's more so how fast can you get back to work, yeah. whether mm -hmm. you're ready or not. And right. that's the unfortunate. So that guilt is like built up from decades of us having to kind of navigate what we've been forced to navigate. And I absolutely understand why parents have that feeling. I mean, dads specifically have that next level where they're going back to work three days after child born because yeah. either they have to or they have access to parental leave like we do in the state of California. But there's all this pressure. Like, why do you need to be mm -hmm. yeah. not at work? You didn't have the baby. Why do you need to be there? And so there's a lot of guilt that comes from both ends related to this in terms of support. And I think for for moms that are navigating it specifically, and to your point, this is what I say out to any mom that we work with in California is you are paying for this. In your paycheck, there is an area that goes to this. In your mm -hmm. paycheck, it's being taken out for this reason. You have access to this because you are paying for this. This is money you put into this. So mm -hmm. you right. absolutely should not feel guilty about this. And, it, you know, in terms of work, if someone gets physically hurt and they go on disability, coming from a leader, you know, we'd have employees go on disability for yeah an injury that they needed to have taken care of and they were off of work for X amount of weeks, months, what have you. And we, that's just part of the protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, and for somehow it feels like it's not as big as that moment of getting an injury versus having right. a child. It's <laughs> right. when you start to think of it like that, you're like, oh my gosh, Ugh. it's a really big deal. It's and big it's deal. okay for me to take this time. Yes. Yeah. I don't know I if this happened to either one of you, but I had a lot of people in my ear saying things like, well, of course you're going to go back. I mean, why would you have gone to college and put all this time into work only to stay home? Yes. Um, and so you're then you're faced with that in your head too. And I just think, I just think so much comes at us as parents, but as mothers, especially like you can't win. You can't make anybody happy. Like, do you have any advice for when you're trying to make that decision and you've got work saying we've invested this in you and other people in your life saying, oh, my God, why would you leave work? And then other people saying, oh, my God, how could you ever have this baby and go back to work? Mm -hmm. Like, how how do you help people tune out the noise and start working through this transition, whichever whichever way they decide to go. So one of the things I always say is like, don't make a decision based on the emotion that you're feeling in that moment. 
Like sit with (laughs) what that feels like for some time. Give yourself grace and time to sit with that feeling and see if that's really how you feel. And that takes time like that. I will be completely honest. When we had our first, I didn't want to go back to work, but we had to have me go back to work. Like mm-hmm. I we right. needed the page. And I interviewed for another position in my company while I was on parental leave. I got in. I was so excited to at least get into my dream job, which was quite amazing that I got while I was on parental leave. <laughs> and at the same point was struggling with these feelings of like, I don't want to be here. I want to be home. Mm -hmm. And it took a while to get through. Like, is that because it's new, it's changed, or is it that really that's where I want to be? And so I just give yourself time and grace to kind of navigate those emotions. I wouldn't open yourself up to be surveyed on like what you're going to do in terms of advice unless, oh that was right. me yeah i was, oh, I was practically too. asking everybody the baby's rs line like i literally called my client my apple client on the bus ride home and was like what do you think should i should i come back should i not i'm like oh yeah i, I totally put it out to survey yeah and then that just yeah. plays with your mind more and yeah. so i i like that's lessons the noise. I will be on. I always had like a few trusted friends that I would just almost like they were just listening as I worked it out in my head. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that that really is a better place to be if you have access to that. Um, right. So support is key. But I think when you survey it out, it just clutters yes. your ability to make the decision that's best for you. But if you return to work, your immediate feelings are, you know, 70% of the time for women is really this thought of like, I don't know if I should be here. And Mm -hmm. I went through that too. And then there's the other side of that, that is like, I'm still guilty. Like I'm here and I actually want to be here. Yeah. And then there's the piece where if you're whole, you feel guilty for the other reason that you mentioned earlier, which is, I worked so hard in my career. I like got this education. I paid all this money for my education and now I'm home. Now what? What does this mean? Now I'm just like doing diapers and struggling with so many other really hard points, but I'm not exercising my brain the same way that I thought I was going to. Yeah. Right. And, And you feel terrible about that. Also, I think that what happens is like when you have time to sit with these things and kind of work through it, you find your space. You find where if you're at home with your kids, you find your way to have those moments where it, it reminds you of the things that you love to be for, um, because those still can coexist whether you're at work or not, you know, mm-hmm. whether that's reading a really amazing book or maybe you're going and taking a class out of college because you really like, want to do that. I do mean, I'm just coming up with different things. Yeah, but these were yeah. things that I talked to my partner about when I was forced out of the workforce after my second child. And I was like, I don't want to not work. And what are we going to do here? Mm-hmm. I want to like go do something. What is that thing that I want to do? And so, you know, I think giving yourself that grace, long-winded here <laughs> is what I recommend. And I think what I wish I had, and I talked about this recently on a show too, like being able to see your way out of it. What I wish I had been able to tell myself is whatever I decide now isn't permanent. I haven't said, okay, well, I'm joining this group and I can never get out of this group. It wasn't a blood oath. It was just my decision (laughs) for then. And it can change. You can change your mind. You can create what it is you want to do, whatever that is. I could not see that. I mean, I felt like I was making a decision and I would only ever be a stay at home mom. And even though that was the right decision for me to make at that time, it still was devastating, devastating. Uh And I just Mm -hmm. spent years mourning that decision. I have so much regret about that because those are years spent in this like should I, shouldn't I, mm-hmm. did I make the right decision? I'm so sad kind of thing. And um, I wish I had just been in it. And so this is what I decided I'm doing it now. And this yeah. is great. And then I can take the next thing when it's time for the next thing. Uh, 
And oh my gosh, it's getting so close to the look, listen, I learn. Know, time. I, I just believe it. I want to just say, I don't know if it's asking something or just trying to give a little grace or asking listeners to give themselves a little grace. But I found that, and people told me this, that sometimes you don't know, I say it a lot, don't know what you don't know. But as far as it's hard to make decisions before the baby's there, as far as like, you don't necessarily know right. what that reaction is going to be, what those hormones are going to be, what mm -hmm. you're physically going to be. It's just things change as soon as you've got a new family member and there's just a new energy into your life and well lack of energy but as far as like <laughs> a new physical presence <laughs> a new exhaustion <laughs> um but sometimes i i think we can put a lot of emphasis on making all these decisions ahead of time when mm -hmm. sometimes you're not going to be able to make that decision and sometimes that decision gets made for you whether the child care is not available um, right. I'm a big fan of having like data points <laughs> as far as making decisions. And one of my data points I didn't know is if like what working me was going to be like after oh. with a kid. And I am so super privileged that I had a husband who was willing and able to do three months so that I had the peace of mind I needed to go back to work knowing that our daughter was with her dad, but then also just to you know, help me through making that decision of like, I could feel myself going back into my workaholic, serving the client at all cost tendencies. And I knew that if I let it go too far, like I wasn't going to come back from it. And so I just needed yeah. to pull myself out of it. But I wasn't going to know that just by thinking about it. And I certainly wasn't going to know that before the baby was born. And so no. I don't know, I, I think maybe it brings up the idea of the importance of paid family leave and just uh -huh. the, and having a society that supports having the flexibility to even have these options because it's nice to be able to maybe go back and try and see if it is a possibility before making a decision you kind of need to have point a and point b to compare and be like okay i've seen what being home is like now i've seen what working with a child is like now i can make an informed decision instead of just making a bunch of assumptions so I don't know. I just, everybody vote, <laughs> support, <laughs> support candidates that support paid family leave. I mean, support businesses that have really strong family leave policies and you know, work for those types of companies, but any other advice around just making sure, I don't know, trying to create a world in where women or parents do have the flexibility to make these choices. I honestly think sometimes we just don't don't take the time to work through what we have access to. And then in the country, we don't have access to a lot, right? We don't. There's only a select few states that have access to paid family leave, but those select few states are actually offering it. And so when your company may say, like, you only have access to this amount at your company, that does not include state. So make sure that you do that research for yourself mm -hmm. uh, because you you could be missing out on some time. Overall, on a federal perspective, it really is the bare minimum. You know, it's unpaid. It's protected based on qualifications that the company hits. And so, you know, that's a whole other piece is like not being paid for that time. You're usually forced back way sooner. And depending on like, your trade, it's it's incredibly too early. Uh, right. So when you're kind of navigating this, having yourself armed with the information is so key. Also, that perhaps the logistic piece, like the childcare piece that you were talking about earlier, where you had to go back to, or you had you had to leave because of childcare too. Mm -hmm. It's really a big component of this, and oftentimes. What happens is parents sort of wait to mm -hmm. to make these decisions. And it doesn't sound like that was your case at all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it happened often in our like in-person groups because of the emotional impact that it had to mm. actually make that decision. So mm -hmm. uh, there were more layers to it than just selecting your child care. There mm -hmm. were a lot of emotions that made it challenging to actually do that.
Yeah. So if you're in a position where you have a partner to support you through this, this is a time where I highly recommend like not doing this stuff alone. And it doesn't lean just on one parent. It should be both parents, if that's the position you're in, kind of working through these things to, together. Oftentimes, this sort of leans on the female and the mother that predominantly home kind of navigating these things. And it really needs to lean towards dual parenting and, and really working together on these decisions. If you're in that situation, you don't have to do it alone. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. And having the information, being armed with information and, yeah. being, and advocating for yourself and not feeling guilty like I did. Use me as, <laughs> yeah. your, use well, me as your lesson. Yeah. I yeah. mean, honestly, like that's a huge part of what learning motherhood is. It's like, let's work through all the logistics. And now let's give you space to kind of work through the emotions and give you the resources to feel like you're still able to be fully in parenting, like with mm-hmm. all our experts that give you all the things that you might have experienced if you were in that mommy and me class or that mm-hmm. parent and me class, the dad class, whatever scenario it is, you're still getting access to that. So you can still feel those feelings and still have those experiences. And at the same time, have the logistics taken care of so those emotions can live and breathe and not get like pushed further, further down and yes. come up in like the most ideal times. Uh, well, can you please tell everybody where they, where their friends, yes. where anyone that needs this information, where yeah. they can find you and where they can get your resources? Yeah. So you can go to learningmotherhood.co. That's probably the best way to find us. I'm on LinkedIn. Look up my name, Kimberly Didrickson. You'll find me there. And we're also on Instagram as well. Um, But in terms of learning about our resources specifically, we have our return to work series and then our company series, which is focused on both men and women. And then our return to work series is focused directly on individual women being able to have access to the information on how to support themselves through the transition back to work. We do coaching all the things. So incredible. I mean, everybody. Incredible resource. Yeah. I mean, seriously, as soon as it should just come in every pregnancy test box should be a link to your website. I I think think there's a marketing opportunity there. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I think it's time for a look, listen, learn. We'll do do a speed round. Yeah. We'll do a speed round. There's just a few minutes left. Um, But for anybody who this is their first time listening, look, listen, learn. We just spend the last couple minutes of every show talking about some things that we are either watching or listening to or learning about. And we don't like to put our guests in the hot seat. So Missy, uh, you want to talk about what you're look, listen, or learning? All right. I have, I have a look, listen, and a learn this week. I'll do them fast. My look was spirited on Apple TV. Have we already talked about that on the show? I, I don't know, but we cannot talk about it enough because it is so I cute. Know. It's so cute. So if you have not seen the Ryan Reynolds, Will Ferrell, Apple TV, it's like a modern reimagined Christmas Carol spinoff kind of thing. It's a musical and it's hilarious and sweet. And oh, uh, it's it is so good. going to rank up there, I think, in my Muppet Christmas Carol, like <laughs> Christmas just the feel good Christmas movies. Yes. Um, so definitely watch it. And I mean, Ryan Reynolds, as usual, is not bad to look at either. So, you know. Oh, now don't leave but... Will Ferrell out. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> okay. Yeah, you better hope on. he's not listening. Yeah. I mean, he's not bad looking either, but he's no Ryan Reynolds. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and I have been listening to a book, Now Is Not the Time to Panic by Kevin Wilson. Uh, and it's about these two kind of loner oddball teens who find each other one summer and then without spoiling anything, they create a piece of art and this art inadvertently starts a chain of events in their little town and 20 years later comes back to impact them. Oh. Um, so it's really good. It's really like I would listen to it, I think, um, if you're into audiobooks because it's narrated really beautifully. Um, sometimes the narrator we've talked about this before yeah. sometimes the narrator like ruins a book for you this one does not and um but i it's one of those that i might actually get a hard copy and go back and forth it's just oh wow well written and kind of fun but also has a little edge to it too so oh. i like it and i haven't finished it yet 
but I feel safe recommending it because it's going to stick the landing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then learning, I took a story summit class on writing a holiday movie. Oh my gosh, how fun. It's just something I've always kind of thought about doing. Did I tell you about my friend Hans Wasserberger who writes uh, Hallmark movies? He's a lawyer yeah. who in his spare time writes Hallmark romance movies. Yeah. yeah. Like there's a whole formula to it and yeah. I learned it and I think I might give it a go, but um, so I'm working through the recording and all the materials they did and that's oh, been how fun. fun. So that's me this week. What about you, Kimberly? Uh, so I do like to watch certain shows. So <laughs> there's uh, several that came out recently that are super good. So I'm going to get to, uh, I watched the documentary about FIFA, the world, because the World Ooh. Cup is going on right now. Oh, yes. Uh, I played soccer in college, so I'm super into all of this right now. And it's very interesting to hear, like, the how FIFA started and sort of all the ups and downs that it's gone through and a lot of corruption. So mm-hmm. it is a very interesting one to watch and i also just finished watching the new series of firefly lee i don't know i I forgot the new this new season was out yes and it is so so good so that's also on netflix (laughs) and then listen um i'm sorry i can't remember the name of the podcast but it has got oh I can't remember right now. I'm going to think of the name of it here. It'll come to you. That's okay. We'll put it, we'll put it in the show notes. Okay. Well, it's three actors and it's just very lighthearted. Oh, it's smartless. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) We know this one. Yeah. I should do a game show just where I can guess a podcast (laughs) by a general description. Like, I know it. It's just kind of nice to have in the background because some of our work Mm -hmm. is intense, right? We're just talking about a lot of intense things. And so it's very lighthearted. So it kind of balances when I'm doing some of my work. So I really like that. Ah, Um, I love that one. That is taught. I mean, that's my must listen that I first thing every week I listen to that because I think it comes out on Mondays. Yeah. Was there one more thing? I don't remember. Uh, have you learned anything? If, oh, uh, learn. We skip that okay. one a lot. <laughs> Some weeks there's no learning. It just doesn't always happen. Uh, well, I'm always learning, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm always learning. Uh, so, yeah, I, I have new challenges with my children on, you know, different stages of life, even though mm-hmm. going through my third one, going through the end of the toddlerhood stage and we're dealing with things that I dealt with before, but in different ways. They're all different personalities. They're all different. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I just was researching when your kids aren't listening to you, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do? Because what that's still a thing. Do? 17 <laughs> years later. Yes. <laughs> Oh my so I, I found two articles, um, also a podcast with Dr. Becky, of course. Um, oh, yes. So anyway. Okay, uh, send us those links and we'll put them in the show notes because I have yeah. a feeling you're not the only parent whose kids are yeah. not listening to them. <laughs> Happy to send them a lot. When they get older, they at least pretend to listen to you and then they just go do whatever they want anyway. <laughs> but at least they awesome. sort of pretend. They just leave their AirPods in all the time, pretend yeah. they don't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay, yeah, all right. And then uh, off they go to do whatever they're going to do anyway. <laughs> yes. So what are you up to, Suzanne? Let's see here. I'm skipping my look because it was it got to be too long and I'm I'm saving it for the next show. <laughs> but okay. right. but I'm listening to the book The Dictionary of Lost Words, which have you heard of this? It's really I've it started out as like I was complaining to my husband. I was like, this is the most boring book I've ever read. Like, why do I have to read this? And now I'm like, I feel like everybody in the world needs to read this book. So okay. uh, it is inspired by the actual events, apparently, around the development of the very first Oxford English Dictionary, which until I read this book, I just kind of thought was just this organic resource that like just always existed. I never thought of someone like making it like it's just the dictionary. It just exists. But so the uh, main character whose name is Esme is 
playing this important role, the voice of women over time and realizing that the original dictionary, so many words that were related to women's lives. And then also people who, you know, were kind of the more commoners or people of a lower income status, their experiences would go unrecorded because the words were not deemed important enough or they're, you know, too slangy or they just, Interesting. and so she goes and starts collecting these discarded words to make her own dictionary of lost words and going through another area of society and collecting the words from the interactions and conversations that different people have. Plus it was set during the time of the women's suffrage movement. So it was just, oh, so it was cool. just really interesting. And, and this was not long ago. I mean, this no. was the, this was the mid 1800s to early 1900s. Like, no. Yeah. And it's I was so, picturing like way longer ago than that. It's made me really interested in the history of it actually making the dictionary. Cause you know, there's so many different, depending on who you are, a word may mean five different things or whatever. Right. And the fact that it was supposed to be a 10 year project. And by year five, I think they had only got through the word ant. <laughs> Like they hadn't even made it halfway through the A's and just that would unhinge me. I'm not meant. For oh project. my God. And there's these photos. Cause they would have these slips of paper it, this for a while. When she was talking about, I thought slips of paper, like a fortune cookie slip. I was like, how do they yeah. keep track of these papers? But it's basically four by six sheets that they would keep in these these shelves just designed for them. And that's where they, people would send in their words that they came across through their journeys or whatever. And whatever they're, I think it had to have like used in a sentence, but it had to be used in a sentence from like a reputable source, oh, like a rep. Okay. So that was also, you know, what defines reputable, you know, which right. newspaper, could it come from the New York times or the Huffington post or, you know, like, so it's just mm -hmm. a very interesting thought process of like who gets to decide which words deserve to be that. kept. So yes, it's very good. And let's see. And I've learned, oh my gosh, you've all been following through my saga. I had did not get the job that I had applied for that I've been talking about. Such a great their experience. Loss. Yeah, they're lost. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it was such a great experience going through it though, especially kind of walking the walk of all the things that we talk about with career coaches on the podcast. And I did think that would be a little anticlimactic if like, you know, I'm like, oh, it's so hard to get a job. And then I interview for one and then I get it. So I do think just <laughs> for the purpose of the podcast, it makes it much, it makes it much more realistic that no, it's not oh, going to be hilarious. that easy. And I am such a strong believer in the importance of the position I was interviewing for again was for a lead organizer trying to get a comprehensive sex ed across the country, which is something that I feel so strongly in that if there is someone that can do a better job at it than me, then yay, I want them to have that job because I just want this job to get done. So congratulations to whoever got it. And I wish them honestly the best of luck. And I'm still going to yeah. support the organization that educate us and seek us because I think that they just do incredible work. So I'll still be supporting them through my import, Informed Parents of Austin organization. And what else was I gonna say? Oh, the other thing, again, I'm, I, I'm just trying to make good out of the bad news, but our interview last week, depending on when it's gonna be aired, we interviewed her last week, I'm not sure when it's gonna air, uh, with Kate Swamy. Mm -hmm. She brought up this really interesting point about keeping in, front of your mind, whatever your non-negotiable is when you're looking mm -hmm. for a new job. And mine has been flexibility. And I totally threw that to the side with this job because it would have been a full time, more than full time, because I'm so passionate about it. I would have gone way overboard and would not have flexibility. And it was super appropriate that I got the news that I did not get the job after I'd literally spent five hours calling plumbers and plunging kind of human day. waste in my toilet that was coming out of the shower drain. I was like, it was a shitty day, literally. <laughs> but I mean, the fact that I have a life where I can do that, mm -hmm. I can take care of that because it would have been like the rest of the weekend because it was the main plumbing line. Like no one was going to take a shower or use a sink or do anything in that house or else it was just going to continue to raise the levels in the shower. So it was, Gross. 
it was a nice reminder that there is a benefit to the flexibility that I have and yeah. I should probably keep focusing on more of a part-time thing versus full-time, at least while our lives are so busy right now. So anyway, yeah. it was a good and a bad, but a nice reminder and just kind of, it was a good little exercise to, yeah. to put some of the things that we've talked about on the podcast to the test. And I've learned a lot and I'll, I'll be just that much more ready for the next time. So that's right. That's, That's my great. learn for the week. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for being here. And I learned so much. And I just, the, we only scratched the surface as usual. An hour feels like a long podcast, but it's really not enough time <laughs> to do three hour episodes. Oh, yes. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And we're really excited for our listeners getting to learn about you because I think you're going to change some lives. I'm sure you're changing lives every day, but hopefully um, you'll change some of our listeners' lives as well, yeah. um, getting those resources they need. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And I really love all the real life things going on <laughs> that is shared and funny, like oh yeah amazing. we share it all yeah no I yeah. love it I love it I'm I'm glad that you have a working shower so oh excited. my god <laughs> I I put a post-it on there just so no one would go in there in the meantime it just said nope and we kept it up there for a few days because I was like the drain may be clear but like things just it, we need like some kind of exorcism in there now yes <laughs> kill all the things yeah <laughs> But yes. Oh, well, and yeah, the, for anybody who's listening that wants more information, make sure you go to the show notes. Because um, yes. we're going to have lots of important links for you there. So that's right. All right. Well, thank you so much. So nice thank to meet you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for the Mom and Dot 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 podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show today. And if you know someone else who could benefit from today's episode, be sure to share it with them. Also, please subscribe and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find links to all the things we discussed today in the show notes over at our website, momandpodcast.com with the A-N-D spelled out. In between shows, you can find us at the socials, including our private mom and community Facebook group. You can find links to the group, all of our socials, and our questions and comments section over at our website, momandpodcast.com. Thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you so much. Now go out there and make your ellipses count.